All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully you had a good weekend. Let, let's get started. We have a lot to cover today. My goal is to kind of finish this first warm-up part of this course where we kind of cover our basics. Uh, and then we will start going into um, topics that will bring us to the what are large language models today. Before we go back into you know where we started last time, I do want to uh, make a correction uh, that uh, of a mistake I made uh, when I was talking about gradient descent before. I was actually talking about stochastic gradient descent. So there is a difference between these ter two terms. Stochastic gradient descent refers to when we make updates after every training uh, instance, so in every iteration. Whereas gradient descent, we would uh, instead average the gradients over the entire training set. So in our for loop, we would just sum the gradients. And then after we have done looping over the entire training set, we would average the gradient and then make the update. So the difference is only when, when are you making the updates, basically, and which, which uh, gradient value. A single value calculated on a single instance or the, uh, uh, the average gradient over the entire training set. And last time I was talking about batching and I, I was trying to introduce mini batch gradient descent. And the reason why I was confused is because in practice, we never use the hosty gradient descent or gradient descent, we use this version, which is mini batch gradient descent. And this is what I was talking at the beginning of the last lecture. And then I had a mistake and I said, okay, please ignore this slide. Uh, I will make a correction. So just one more time, let's go over this. Uh, with mini batch gradient descent, we have the same procedure I was showing you before, the one that you implemented in your first uh, assignment, where um, you are having certain number of iteration or epochs. And now you are in every, in every uh, iteration, you are sampling a batch of data points at random. That could be, let's say 32 points at random. You calculate for each one of these data points the gradient with respect to the uh, that data point, uh, the gradient of the loss function, and then you are aggregating the gradient. And only after you have the average gradient in this mini batch, you make the update. Okay. So this is what the mini batch gradient descent is, and this is the version we always use in practice today. So this is this is the version you uh, need to know. And maybe just to uh, kind of stress the differences between gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, and mini batch. Gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent basically are two, I would say, two extremes. In uh, gradient descent, you are taking the average gradient over your entire data, which is nice because then your, we would say your gradient is a noisy. You kind of took into account everything you can see in your training data. However, it's really slow to calculate the gradient over the entire training set, which could be massive, and only then make the, uh, the update of the weights. That would take a very long time. With stochastic gradient in descent, in the end, uh, on the other side, you are making quick updates. After seeing every training example, you are changing the weights. But if you have one uh, gradient that is, for some reason, way larger than what the average gradient is in the training data, that would throw off your optimization. And when you would look at the loss curves, you would see these weird oscillations. And then eventually they would start to converge into something that looks like a line. But because of this, you would need more uh, iterations. So um, mini batch is something in between where you're taking a batch of data and you're considering um, uh, more information about the, what the average gradient should be, but you're not taking the entire uh, training set. All right, so that's a little correction. Uh, please uh, keep that in mind. And for now on, you will uh, be using mini batch gradient descent. Okay, so moving uh, back to our, you know, what we have been talking about since we started this course, which is what are these components of the supervised machine learning system for text classification? We have stopped with finding more. Uh, informative features of the input, which we can then give to a neural network. We have learned about one uh, example of a neural network, namely feedforward neural network. Uh, and uh, this network can make uh, predictions for us, such as what is the sentiment uh, class of a text or what is the topic of a text and so on. We stop with the, with the skipgram 
work to VEC algorithm. Just a little quick recap. Our goal was to learn these word embeddings where semantically similar words are closed together in the vector space. And we started with the distributional hypothesis, which says that uh, words that appear in common contexts are uh, often have similar or related meanings. And we were kind of riffing off that idea to uh, build these embeddings, these word vectors that will have these properties that if they are similar or related, that they will be close to be close together in the vector space. So instead of counting like before, like you did in your homework, uh, we trained a classifier that predicts, given a pair of a target and a potentially context word, whether they are really uh, together somewhere in the distribution. And whenever we think about distribution, we think about corpus. For us, corpus, actual realization of some distribution of uh, text. Uh, and for us, the way we kind of approach this, uh, we again had a very shallow uh, neural network here, and our goal was to maximize the probability that the target word is going to be predicted to like to be predicted to show up next to some surrounding word C if the embedding similarity of these two words uh, is high. And uh, we had our positive examples, the pairs of target and context words that indeed had show up in the corpus. And these serve as our positive examples. And we wanted to signal to uh, our uh, model to learn embeddings uh, such that their probability uh, is, uh, of being together is high, which is achieved by having their dot product being um, high. On the other hand, we wanted to minimize the probability that the target word is going to appear with some surrounding word if it did not appear in the corpus. And for this, we introduced the notion of uh, negative samples where we randomly sampled some word to be um, uh, you know, together with our chosen target word, a negative example. And we said, yeah, surely there are gonna be uh, some noise here because maybe we will sample a word that actually appears together in the context, but that's not gonna appear frequently. So this is how we are. We trained the skipgram model, and now we have these embeddings. We have utterly trained everything. We just keep these embeddings uh, in the end. We don't care about this classifier. Classifier just serve the purpose to learn these embeddings, and then we ditch and forget about it. What we care about are these embeddings, which we learned for each single word. And now what do we do with this? Um, now we are going to use them uh, for training our neural network. And this is slightly different from how you had um, created your feature vector for your first assignment when you are counting, where you had immediately entire representation of our entire input sequence. Here we have representation of every word. So we need to combine this word embedding somehow to get the representation of the text that these words make. And one of the simplest way to do that is take word embedding of each one of the words in a sentence or piece of text we have, for example, here, this is a, a movie review about the movie Predator. Predator is a masterpiece. We now have word embedding for each one of these words. And to get one representation, uh, we can, for example, average them. And we will get a single vector. Um, why do we need a single representation? Well, remember what our neural network is. It, is, it takes some vector. And then it makes nonlinear projection of that vector, right? It does not take a sequence of vectors, right? So it always works with a single uh, vector. So here we are averaging these vectors to have a single vector that then uh, we can feed into our uh, neural network. Now, last time I was rambling at the end about some things and I wanna show them. Unfortunately, one of my uh, uh, USB, uh, Ports is broken, uh, I don't know how, I guess taking it to the desert canyoneering was not a great idea. So I can't plug in my uh, iPad, I will uh, do this on the whiteboard and then take a photo later and, and um, uh, put them on the slide. So one thing I was talking about was uh, padding. Um, I'll try to speak loud, but let me know if I'm not loud enough. So uh, just a reminder, what the definition of a feed forward neural network was. Is this large enough? 
Okay, please uh, let me know if not. All right, so we have some uh, feature representation, which I denoted with f of x. And let's say it was uh, part of R D one. Now our next uh, operation was linear projection. And we said, how do we achieve linear, uh, linear transformation? What, what kind of operation does a linear transformation of a vector? Yeah, matrix, matrix vector operation. So we need to define some vector of matrix uh, W and it is going to be part of R. Um, so now remember how matrix vector multiplication works. Uh, we know that the number of columns will be D1, right? Because we are going to multiply from the left with F of X. Uh, the other dimension is a hyperparameter. This is something you are going to set. And this sets what the size of the output uh, transform vector is going to be, which I'm going to call V2 here. Very often, that's going to be uh, called the hidden dimension. Actually, I'm going to write this down. So we, we have W, R, D2 times D1. Uh, this is often called uh, lead this this operation we are going to do next so all right so here we have linear transformation of our feature vector f of x into our hidden or latent representation which i called h1 okay this is often called linear transformation as we know or linear layer and one terminology I didn't mention before, which is gonna be useful, is that this is often called input dimension, input size or input dimension. And this is often called output size. Can anyone just tell me, tell everyone why you all know this, but it would be good just to spell it out once. Come on, I'm sure you have an idea. Why, why would this be called input size? Yes, please. Uh, it's the same size as our vector. Uh -huh. This vector right here, right? Yep. And uh, this vector is the one which is being multiplied by our uh, matrix. So in a way, you can imagine it. If, if you imagine this being the layer, you can imagine the this vector coming into that layer. And this vector is of the size of D1, therefore that's input size. And what we get out of this transformation is H1, which is the vector of the size D2. And in that sense, that's output size. So this is the terminology you are gonna see in Python. So that, that one is uh, good to know. Okay, so back, this is just a recap of feed over neural networks that we learned uh, probably like uh, two weeks ago. Um, I was talking about averaging these vectors. And one thing um, I tried to also illustrate last time is what wouldn't work or what wouldn't work with additional um, tricks. So if you had, I'll write it here. So we have uh, these uh, predator is a masterpiece. We have four words. Uh, what I was say, trying to say at the end of the last uh, lecture was, what if we try to do concatenation operation? So concat is an operation where you basically produce one vector by stacking these four vectors together. So you would have, Each one of these is uh, D1. So we would have a vector of size uh, four times D1. What if I had another sentence where, so four words ended up here with four, with size 41, right? What if I had three words? How many, what would be the size of the vector uh, that we get with concatenation operation? Three D one. Three, three D one. Perfect. So here we have four D one, three D one. If we had five words, five D one. You know, as many words we have, this dimension of the uh, vector we get with 
concatenation operation changes. Can someone tell me why this becomes an issue if this is our feature vector f of x? Yes, please. Exactly. So here we have this, we produce this matrix, which is uh, whose dimensions we fix knowing what the size of our input feature vector is. If your input feature vector size changes all the time, then you cannot do this linear transformation, right? Everything is then a mess. So one thing people do uh, to kind of, if we, if we would like to really, really like to do this kind of operation uh, is uh, padding. So if you had three words here, for example, and if you know that four is the max sequence length in your in your training corpus, then you would here add one word at the end, special word called pad. You would add it to your vocabulary. You would assign it some embedding. Very often we use zero embedding with all zeros because you don't want these vectors to have any influence on operations because they are serving the single purpose to be able to do linear transformation over here. So very often we will just pad it to the maximum sequence length uh, seen in the training data and assign pad to uh, zero embedding. Okay. I said, and I emphasize training data because you can never look at your test data. If any of your test instances are longer than your training instances, the best you can do is crop them either from, you know, before or from the beginning or the end, whatever you deem it's more important for your task. Sometimes people finish their review explicitly saying what their overall opinion of the movie is. So maybe it's better to, you know, strip your text from the uh, beginning. Okay, so padding is a very important operation in um, in uh, deep learning. Here, you maybe will say, well, I don't care about padding. I'll just use this other operation, which is averaging, right? Later on, we won't be able to circumvent the padding issue, and it will come handy again. So remember what padding is. It's padding the sentences. Uh, the text, the training example, up to the maximum uh, possible sequence length. And uh, in the case of this kind of neural network where we use word embeddings, um, you will assign zero embedding to those. Okay, so yeah, I also want you to remember like what kind of operation we can use to produce, you know, a single vector from multiple word embeddings. One choice is averaging. Um, sometimes people will use, um, for example, how did they call this one? Um, I just introduce some terminology here. So here we have C once being uh, our embedding. So C I is the I uh, embedding. By I, I mean the uh, embedding of the I word uh, in the uh, text. Um, you could be creating a representations that are, uh, and this is something people have been doing in 2015, uh, you could create, um, uh, maybe not with this. Okay, sure, why not? So you would have I from one to four here, and you would take the, um, Actually, uh, no, forget about this. I, I get something, uh, some other task in mind here. The averaging is simply the best, sorry. We will come to what I wanted to say um, when we start to do like things like relation prediction between two spans, but this is this is sufficient for, uh, uh, for sentence classification. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say relating to what I was mumbling about last time. Don't forget, uh, linear transformation is defined through this matrix. This matrix is of a certain size, and therefore you need to be careful with what the size of your feature uh, vector is. When you deal with word embeddings, you have variable amount of uh, number of uh, words in different sentences. 
you have to be careful what how do you aggregate the bedings to create a uh, vector of a single piece of text. Okay. Um, let me go back to this one. Uh, is this whole uh, network clear? Basically here, we didn't learn anything new since the time I have introduced we four neural networks, except that now our input is not that feature vector where we have counts, which is long and sparse, rather this average of word embeddings. That much clear? So if I go back to kind of slides I was using, here f of x is what has changed in this entire diagram. This is no longer, again, the feature vector of counts. Rather, it's the average word embeddings from word that constitute the sentence. And I said two things which I want to come back to. You could treat these embeddings in two different ways. You can treat them as they are the weights of your neural network too. Meaning when we do back propagation and we change weights, you could also be changing your word embeddings uh, because now everything is part of the same model. And this is nice if you know your end task uh, text is um, somewhat of a different, we would say domain than what these word embeddings were trained on. So word embeddings were trained on news. And maybe you are dealing with clinical notes. And now this is a way different medical language. And you know that there is some mismatch between the terminologies. And you want your embeddings to be tweaked a little bit because you know the way we will use some words in news might be a little bit different than how they are used in uh, medicine. So you can also treat them as parts of your weights and further change them. Um, that means that you have a larger number of parameters, so overall training will take longer, and maybe you don't need to do that. Maybe you wouldn't get any gains. You could just keep these vectors as um, not part of the weights, just a part of uh, your input. Okay. In and out of dimensions, that's what we uh, have covered. And uh, I have said this, but I will repeat it. Uh, now the difference between with these word embeddings and what we have done previously is that these word embeddings have been learned from the data. Whereas before we were deciding what would be a good feature of a word or a piece of text to add into our model. And uh, once people have switched from, you know, creating this feature manually, into using word embeddings in 2015, they have seen massive improvements in task performance. This was one of these big things that had happened uh, in NLP. This was the first uh, recent thing that uh, nine to five to 10 years ago that have given this big boost where it started to kind of take away this manual uh, approach. So basically with all of this, with this approach, you kind of know what was the state of the art um, in 20, 2015, if you wanted to do text classification. And when we go into more complicated approaches, we will gonna, I'll come back and say why this might still be a good case for you, why this might be sufficient approach uh, depending on the task you choose to work on today. Okay, so how do we evaluate whether are these word embeddings any good? Uh, basically what I just said right now, if you observe that if you swap your previous feature vectors with these word embeddings, namely average word embeddings, and you get great boosts in performance for, we would say, downstream tasks, your end goal, which is for us uh, in these couple of weeks have been an example of sentiment classification, well, then you know that they are better, that they kind of fulfill the, what we wanted. We wanted some representations which uh, have better you know, better capture the meaning of the words, which then enable us to do all sorts of NLP tasks. So this is called extrinsic evaluation. Our goal was not to solve sentiment classification while we were learning these word embeddings, but our ultimate goal was to plug in these word embeddings into a larger system and get performance boosts. 
And this is a, a type of evaluation we, in general, regardless of uh, the task or anything, uh, we call extrinsic uh, evaluation, where you put this uh, thing you just developed into a larger system and observe uh, the downstream effects. Intrinsic evaluation would be create doing the evaluation that uh, the measures the model's performance directly on the specific task you designed the model for. So we designed the Skipgram model to have these similar words being close to each other, right? Um, we have data sets where people have said, I believe these two words are similar this much and gave some quantity. So we can be, uh, we can use um, these uh, data sets to see whether um, similarities between words, rankings between, uh, uh, let me let me put this uh, differently. If we have uh, some words and we want to rank how similar they are, uh, we can get uh, this information by taking dot products of word embeddings, right? And then we can rank the similarities. And we can then see how people have ranked the similarities of the same word, and we can check whether we get similar rankings. And if we do, that means that these word embeddings are modeling similarity of these words similar like people would. And this is the type of evaluation we would call intrinsic uh, evaluation. This, this is a good sanity check, but this is a, a thing that people care about. In the end, people, when you create new word embeddings, they care, are they gonna help and a modeling of the uh, NLP tasks uh, downstream. Okay, are there any questions about the evaluation? Yes. So, uh, you said we have a version of this, but so this is going to be an interesting part of the technology of the regular schedule again, uh, or it's going to be one of the layers of the model, which are the developers. Sure. I didn't get what you mean by it in your first sentence. You say the model is modeling it. What is so, it? Uh, are they uh, formulating the graphics or are they using one of the particular layers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we use uh, our weights of the skip grant model. We said our parameters are actually uh, the embeddings we are trying to learn. So last time we said these are the weights and we are always, when we are doing backpropagation, we are changing the weights, nothing else. You know, backpropagation touches only the weights, like the equation for the update is weights minus the uh, step size times the gradient. Uh, okay. Weights. Word embeddings and the weights in the skip count are the same thing. So they are said to be the same thing. The only part of the model is the embeddings. So initially we sent them to random weights. We take dot products between the target word and the surrounding word. And then we apply sigmoid. This gives us probability. We plug it into our loss and then we web propagate. So yeah. The embedding and weights in this case, especially in the case of Skipgram, are the same thing. And probably never again. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me go over some few differences between uh, these uh, feature vectors we have learned. So in this column, we have the uh, properties of our count feature vector of bag of words and average embeddings. Um, first, in terms of the length and the size of these vectors, we know with the bag of words that the size is gonna be the number of words that we have in vocabulary, which can easily be tens of thousands, right? Uh, we have seen with the last time with word to vec that the vocabulary is actually of the size uh, of almost 700,000. Um, so, this is quite substantial, right? It's a, it's a massive vector. Whereas with embeddings, we set the size of these embeddings to, to be something we choose to be. And uh, these initial word embeddings were set to sizes either 50 or 300. So now we have massive reduction of this vector size. In terms of the interpretability of these vectors, with the counts, it was nice because we knew that every dimension corresponds to the count of the word 
which has the index uh, in the vocabulary, vocabulary of that dimension we are looking at right now. So you could, if you had um, just a linear model, we knew that every weight correspond to every feature. So if some weight was very large, you kind of could tell, okay, I believe that my model deems this word to be important for predicting uh, this to be positive, for example. With embeddings, you no longer have any interpretability. So now you have these dense vectors and you have no idea what any of these dimensions means. Absolutely, you have no, you do have zero information about what these dimensions are now um, corresponding to. And this is this first switch from, as I said, from manual to this data-driven representation where you get these downstream boosts in performance, but you are losing the interpretability. Everything is becoming, as I said, more black box. You are having less understanding of what's going on. Uh, with your model. But the performance, in, for, excuse me, performance boosts are so large that you can't ignore that. And you, you know, this is why we kept using the word embeddings and then even more complicated and, and black boxy approaches. In terms of the sparsity, meaning how many zeros there are in these vectors, we know that our count vectors were really sparse, right? Uh, your vocabulary can be massive, but most of these words never appear in every single training instance you have. So you have very long, but very sparse vector, unlike with these embeddings where you have uh, no zeros. It's always some value there, some continuous value. And this is important for uh, neural networks. These neural networks have empirically been shown not to work well with these large sparse vectors. So this was an important um, achievement to actually have uh, the neural networks that were work well uh, in practice. Um, okay, so here now we are getting into something we didn't learn uh, yet, but I want to emphasize this is that both of these approaches uh, deem either of the every word uh, we seen um, as having static interpretation. But we have learned about synonyms, right? So one word can have different meaning in uh, uh, in one context rather than in the other. I will. I, I was, I think, giving an example of a basin that can mean uh, various things. So these word embeddings, as our count of counting approach, both disregard that these things might have different meanings. That the word can have different meaning in different contexts. And later, with our first initial pre-trained language models, we are going to learn about representations of texts that no longer are static. What words uh, representation are going to change depending in the context of a given instance they appear in. Um, so I put it here, but then later we'll see uh, how this is going to change. In terms of regarding the word order, um, let me go back here. So here, um, if we had predator is a masterpiece or masterpiece predator is, uh, we would have same representation. Okay, I ditched the word A, but whatever. Uh, if you sw swap the order of how these words appear in the sentence, you in the end take their embeddings and average them. So you, what you get here, regardless of how you scramble these uh, words, you get the same uh, representation. And that's that's not great uh, because word order matters. Uh, and this is the case both with word embeddings and with our counting approach. We never really recorded in which, you know, uh, what is the position of the word, let's say masterpiece in uh, where in a given text it has appeared. So this is bad. And again, with later approaches, we are gonna see uh, how to fix that. I will mention just briefly, uh, briefly today. Um, then last time I started the lecture by saying we want to capture all of these different types of meanings, like synonyms, similar, similar or related words. And we have seen with our count feature vectors that all of these were kind of approached similarly. They were all distinct features, right, in uh, our uh, vector. However, with average embeddings, uh, these vectors, uh, word vectors from similar related words are gonna be close to each other. Uh, so when you average them, um, you will have, you will kind of, um, 
L let me put this differently. If you have one sentence and another sentence and you have similar but not exactly words used in those two sentences uh, by averaging the bendings of those words and then comparing the resulting vectors, you will get a vector that's still similar, in, you know, close in the vector space. And in this way, you have captured that, okay, these two pieces of text are similar. Whereas with feature vectors where we counted the features, we did not capture this uh, at all. So now we have much better, you know, we much better capture these important aspects of meanings like similarity of word, relatedness of word, antonymy of words, and so on, uh, which is important for all of NLP tasks. And therefore it's not surprising that these things were so effective uh, in terms of giving us boosts in performance relative to using um, just uh, previous uh, counting features we have seen. Okay, are there any questions about these differences? All right, so I'm just thinking whether I don't want to talk about this. Okay, I will skip this for a moment. Um, and I want to finish with um, just a few analysis of these uh, embeddings before we switch into PyTorch tutorial. Um, so. One thing that's became very popular when these things have become popular in about 2015 are visualizing these vector spaces. And remember, these are high dimensional vectors of size 50 or 300, uh, so we can't visualize them directly. So people use these 2D, uh, excuse me, dimensionality reduction approaches to map them into two dimensional vectors, and then you can visualize these uh, two dimensional vectors. I do want to emphasize that uh, dimensionality reduction technique and visualizing projected vectors is very finicky. This is a one great block class that where you can tweak different parameters and see how visualization would change just by tweaking them. So be cautious when you see this kind of visualizations. They are nice to look at, but we, in, you know, when we do publications, this would never be an evidence of something. It might be like a supporting analysis, but we would never just show here is a visualization and therefore my hypothesis uh, is confirmed because people know that these things are finicky. In any case, uh, you can pick some words and then you can show k nearest neighbors, meaning k vectors that are in the closest proximity to the chosen vector. And here, uh, these uh, authors here have picked some three words and then taken their k nearest neighbor. So let's look in, into this. So here we have not good, dislike, bad, worse, worse, incredibly bad, incredibly uh, bad, yeah. So you see here how um, how um, these uh, words that appear close to each other are all in kind of hinting on something uh, negative. I don't know how they achieve not good, uh, like these are two words, I don't know whether they are visualizing the word embedding, the average embedding of not and uh, and good. I don't know what exactly they are doing here, but the point is that you have ended up in um, uh, in the close, uh, you know, uh, in a close, in this close, in this space, you have words that signal something negative, right? Uh, then here we have one on the other uh, hand, very good, amazing, terrific, nice, good, fantastic, incredibly good, wonderful. Uh, these are all uh, positive uh, sounding um, uh, words. And here we have a kind of a mixed tool by that now S R I U with is then. It's a little bit unclear, right? Or less clear than it was with these positive and negative words. One interpretation here would be maybe these are very frequent words, like similar to stop words. Uh, maybe here we are learning about common pronoun and associated verbs uh, to be uh, and so on. So it's not, not always easy to interpret these uh, vectors. And you can see how um, this is kind of coming from the fact that we have embraced the distributional hypothesis, which is words that appear together often are similar. So words I and M or 
uh, U and R are gonna appear very often together. They're not similar words, they just appear in uh, frequent, uh, frequently together in corpora, right? Um, another thing that has been very popular are these uh, analogy or relational similarity tests, um, uh, such as uh, solving A is to B as A star is to uh, what, which is often framed uh, with this kind of formulation. So apple to uh, a tree is similar to a grape, what's grape to a wine. Uh, or king is uh, to uh, what? What is um, excuse me? King to a man is similar to what a woman is to a queen. What uh, Paris is to France is what uh, Italy is to Rome, and things like that. And you can get this uh, from uh, basically uh, doing the vector operations on um, with uh, word embeddings, uh, where you take. Um, so here it would be the vector of a tree. You subtract the vector of an apple, add the vector of grape, and then you check what is the nearest neighbor of the vector you have produced by doing these operations. And whatever that nearest vector, vector is, you take it and then you check which word that vector represents and you say, okay, that's the um, how, the word to vec would solve the analogy problem. And it has been very popular because you can do all sorts of funky things. This pro there is a lot of problem with these um, analogical reasoning things. It's yet another, you know, like type of analysis people like to show because it's very flashy, but it has many issues and it's not necessarily something that would be uh, scientifically rigorous as an evidence uh, of, of something. But as, as these analogies have been popular, then people were also checking what kind of biases are encoded in these uh, word vectors. So they were doing things like computer programmer minus vector of a man plus vector of a woman, and the nearest neighbor would be the vector of a word homemaker. Or doctor vector of a doctor minus vector of a man plus vector of a woman would uh, result in the a nearest vector being the vector representing nurse, kind of encoding prototypical or stereotypical profession women um, uh, might have. And of course, this comes from the fact that these uh, stuff are learned from the uh, distributions of the data. Data itself has a lot of uh, information uh, with stereotypes and other things uh, encoded in it. The issue is uh, what we call bias amplification. That's when your model learns that, uh -huh, there are these patterns. I see women being very often nurses or women being very often um, homemakers. And maybe it sees that um, three times in the corpus, uh, the woman was associated with a homemaker. But then uh, later when it needs to, let's say Ch when ChatGPT needs to generate um, combination of words, women and homemaker, you would expect it that it will do it three times less than it would with something else, but it exaggerates uh, this, uh, these things and starts to with way higher probability put these things together. And this is what we call uh, bias amplification or distributional uh, bias. There are different kinds of biases to have in mind. I hope we'll get to talk about this a little bit more uh, when we have uh, safety issues in uh, LLMs. Uh, here, I just want to mention how, why, why this is an important. So, um, if you decide to make, uh, let's say, a tool that takes CVs and uh, the job posting is uh, for a programmer and you take word embedding approach and you know that these stereotypes are encoded and you know that there is bias amplification, your model might demote um, applications for women uh, because it associates uh, female names uh, less with the uh, programming jobs. Um, so this is called a, an example of allocation farm where you would not call female applicants for a job just because your system had uh, disregarded those applications. Um, and then the final type of harm we I didn't mention is the representational harm where the certain groups can be associated in these vector spaces with uh, certain things they shouldn't be associated. So in this, um, uh, in this work, people have investigated um, 
how often Western, typical Western uh, white names are associated with pleasant word and uh, names that uh, are often given to African-American people, how often they are um, associated with unpleasant words and they've seen high correlations with this. So just another example of different societal biases that can be uh, encoded in these things. And because everything is not interpretable, you don't have clear understanding how this can propagate uh, later on. And the biasing is very hard. This is one classic paper uh, uh, on this topic where if you, the biasing is a set of techniques where people try to remove this uh, concept of uh, societal biases from these representations. So kind of erase this information, ensuring that uh, you have erased this information with high guarantee uh, that you completely erased it is incredibly hard. And same goes with privacy. We will have a guest lecture on privacy and how to erase, if your, uh, let's say, language model had learned your name, your address, your gender, and you want this information to be um, removed from the LM as you have the right under, let's say, European law, um, we don't have methods to do that 100%, you know, completely raise it and ensure that it has been erased. It's an active area of uh, research. Okay, so I want to stop with uh, word st embedding stuff here. Uh, I want to switch to the PyTorch, but since we are switching to PyTorch, are there any questions about word embedding approach? Uh, this is, um, I, as I mentioned before, so basically this uh, deep averaging network over here is what you will be implementing in your uh, second assignment, which I will release uh, today. So if you have any questions right now, let's address those so you can start working on your second assignment immediately. Okay, very good. No questions. All right, so then um, please open, uh, take your laptops out. Uh, if you don't have a laptop, please sit next to someone who has. Um, open the slides, which are linked in the schedule, and uh, open this uh, link I shared here. Okay, does everyone have their laptop open? Do you have this notebook open? Is anyone still working on that? Okay. Okay, this is gonna be pretty experimental. I haven't done this before. Um, what I want us to do is basically go through these together. So as I'm running the cells, I want you to be running cells as well. I'll try to be, kind of let you also experiment a little bit if you want to try like uh, different things similar to what's in the cell. And um, yeah, so it's not, there is a lot. We could talk about PyTorch a lot and try a gazillion things. Here, I want us today just to go over some basic functionalities and I want you to get a sense of what PyTorch is. It's uh, quite similar to NumPy but uh, created for deep learning specifically. So it has GPU support and training and all of that. Um, and you know, today, today you will at least see it once. So you kind of have an impression of what kind of library you will be using for your second and all later assignments, such that it doesn't come surprise if you start working on it a little bit late and realize, oh boy, this is something completely or new to me. So yeah, I won't be able to answer every single question you have. Uh, here, we will just get the first um, you know, intro to PyTorch. And then if you have more questions, just try things around. There is so much documentations on the 
uh, on the web and ChatGPT is pretty good at answering questions about PyTorch. Always be careful with using ChatGPT because it can give you false information and ask it explanation for whatever, whatever you want to do. Like if you want to learn new functionality, just uh, prompt it to also give you an explanation for you to understand why that's the way to approach that. Okay, are we ready now? Great. Uh, if I'm going too fast, also please stop me. As I said, I'm doing this for the first time, so I have no idea how this is gonna work uh, with you all running it at the same time. So first thing I will ask you to do is to click file and then save a copy in Drive. I believe in this way, you will be working with your own individual uh, notebooks rather than on the same one I'm using here. So please make sure to do that. Done? Yeah, okay. All right, so I have uh, taken the notebook that was created by uh, Stanford folks uh, in their NLP uh, tasks. So thanks uh, to them. And I just shortened it and I added more explanations and a few more things that I deemed are missing there. We have all made a copy in our drives, I hope. And yeah, just a word about PyTorch. PyTorch is a deep learning framework. It's very similar, as I said, uh, to NumPy in terms of the semantics, but it does support uh, uh, GPU training and stuff that you need for training neural networks, such as optimization with version of gradient descent you like, which you wouldn't get in NumPy, right? Um, so first thing is to import PyTorch and there is a, a neural network module in uh, Torch. So here we're gonna import it as MN and we're gonna be doing some uh, fancy printing. Ooh. Okay, this is a bit slower than I would like it to be, but it's done. All right, did you run the first cell? Yes, thank you. Okay, so the first uh, thing uh, to kind of cover is about tensors. And uh, there is a lot to be said here. So uh, let's just cover the most important things. Uh, first of all, tensors are the most basic building blocks uh, in, um, in uh, PyTorch. And each tensor is just multi-dimensional array. So you might have, for example, if this was a computer vision uh, course, then we would learn that, okay, uh, image can be, you know, resized and whatever, and then we would get 256 by 256 square image uh, where each one of these um, uh, values in the image represents a pixel in the image. And we will learn, okay, colors can be represented with three channels, uh, red, green, and I guess blue, uh, whatever, three colors. And so you need to, for every pixel record, three numbers to get the actual color that pixel is representing, meaning you need a tensor of a size three by 256 by 256. And this would be an example of a tensor. If you learn it in math, you will first sentence you will hear it's a generalization of a matrix. So we have vector, matrix, you know, scalar, vector, matrix, then a tensor. Okay. And very similar to NumPy arrays, but come uh, with GPU support, which makes them ideal for uh, deep learning uh, tasks. So for example, uh, we might wanna create a tensor where we have uh, two, uh, two rows and three columns. And these are examples of two rows, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can create a list of lists. And then you just call torch.tensor on that list to create a tensor that has that shape. You can you don't need to create a list and then give it as an input to torch.tensor. You can immediately have torch.tensor with, you know, uh, without creating a variable or list of lists, which is given in this uh, next uh, cell over here. So pretty simple, right? Okay, right. Okay, so first thing we learned is tensors are the, you know, our basic units uh, for uh, working with PyTorch. You have a bunch of utility functions that can help you create tensors uh, from, uh, you know, uh, of a given shapes with given values. 
Uh, for example, we have seen that we like uh, vectors or matrices or tensors with all zeros or all ones. And luckily there is storage dot zeros with where you can give, an, uh, give a shape, let's say a matrix of size two by five, or you might want a tensor of all ones of size three by four. So easy, this is great. This is something we'll probably keep using. There were three, I would say, important properties of tensors uh, as you know, objects in Torch. These are the data type, uh, meaning are they floats? Are we saving integers? What is the uh, type of the values we are saving in the tensor? There is a shape of tensor, and then there is a, something called device, where on which hardware are you putting your set tensor, either on your CPUs or GPUs. So here you can, for example, see that you can set, um, so I didn't say it, but uh, to set uh, a data a tensor type, um, you need to use the uh, this argument D type and set it to certain value, such as torch float 32. Here is it. And here in this uh, notebook, they are just you know changing the how uh, this uh, number is appearing. So here we had all zero, so you can see zero dot, which kind of signals that indeed you have a you have a float uh, numbers here. Um, if you see 0 0.1, bunch of ones here, you see how they are uh, indeed recorded here with uh, a bunch of ones uh, and so on. Okay, and uh, if you have decimal point, points and you don't set the data type, it will get on its own that it's, uh, it's a float uh, number. So yeah, sometimes you need to be setting this. Then the next thing we care about is the shape. Shape, the probably the cause of all your troubles when you implement these things, massively important, your best friend when you are debugging. Uh, so here, uh, for example, we have matrix of, uh, you know, um, what is the size of this thing? Two by three. We have here matrix of, um, of or oh, sorry guys. So here we have just a standard matrix two by three. And I think, you know, you're kind of familiar with matrices. Here we have three 3D tensor and its shape is gonna be three by two by four. Um, very often in deep learning, we have 3D tensors. And the way to think about them, uh, the way I suggest to think about them is your first dimension is almost always batch size. So basically the way you can read this is I have three of something and uh, these three are usually representing my individual instances. And in this case, uh, what you're left with are 2D matrices, right? All of them being two by four matrices. So you can read this as I have three uh, matrices of the shape two by four, which is useful to think. Um, yeah, very often you will have issues with uh, shapes. I think I have uh, given an example later where we see an error you would get if you have a shape issue. And there, um, the issue with PyTorch is that PyTorch in, in, in the background is doing a lot of reshaping and all sorts of things. So by the time you get an error, you it might be too far removed from the actual point where the shape issue is occurring. So the, the type of, uh, you read what the error says and mention some shapes and you're like, I have no idea which tensors this error is about because I have never created a tensor of this shape. So your debugging basically involves trying to trace back where the first shape issue occurs. So you can't just re, you know, rely on seeing the error uh, at the end and being like, oh, okay, this, this tensor has wrong shape. You kind of need to do a little uh, you know, scavenger hunt to find your uh, tensor that has the problematic shape. So yeah, you, you very often will just be putting checkpoints while debugging and seeing where is the first shape issue you encounter. Okay, and final property I mentioned is devices. So uh, this is just this uh, argument here, device equal. If you say CUDA, that means you are using GPU because GPUs these days are mostly using, using CUDA drivers because we are mostly using NVIDIA 
AMD is kind of coming onto the playground and they would will be using a different drivers, which are not CUDA drivers, but right now NVIDIA is uh, the most important player here. So CUDA drivers are used and um, here you would set device equal CUDA to say, I'm gonna be using GPU or device equals CPU if you will be not using uh, GPUs. Libraries that you will be using later, like Hugging Faces ecosystem, will assume you have GPU, and then uh, sometimes the code will crash if you run it on CPU, and you will need to you know, specify the device equals CPU to have everything running smoothly, otherwise it will start to use some GPU stuff that you don't have. Okay, did we all run everything up to this point? I hope to hear yes, at least one. Yeah, yeah cool, all right, very good. Um, okay, so these are the three, uh, three properties you care about, and uh, now let's look into some uh, operations. So, as I said, shapes are what you need to take care of a lot when you are developing neural networks and therefore reshaping is an important operation. When you realize I have a wrong shape and I just need to reshape it in this way, then you can call uh, these uh, these uh, uh, functions. Uh, so here we will make, let's see what this does. Uh, we have, uh, we are going to create a uh, tensor uh, from one to, uh, you know, uh, 16, so up to 15. And the current shape, um, is going to be just a vector of size 15. Uh, and then you can reshape it to be of uh, the uh, size five by three, so a matrix. And um, you can see here how the tensor is going to look like if you do that. Uh, basically, what it does is um, takes uh, you know chunks of three and puts them into the rows. OK? And you know. Here, the function is dot view instead of something like reshape. So that's good to know that uh, if you need to be reshaping something, you are going to use a function uh, which is not named reshape. <laughs> OK, another thing you might uh, do a lot is uh, matrix multiplication. Um, here, it is this one, A dot. So you are multiplying A with B. And then you say a dot math mu b, similar notation to non five b to use at. And now we get into broadcasting, which if you are familiar with NumPy, you know what broadcasting is. But uh, if you either forgot or haven't heard about it, broadcasting basically is natively to this library allowing operations with uh, objects that are matrices or tensors that are not of a good shape, right? So we know that uh, to multiply, let's say, two matrices, the dimension of the number of columns and number of rows of these two matrices has to match. And sometimes these things won't match, but it will be possible to do operations. For example, the most uh, common thing you might be using if you have a scalar and you want to, it has you know just the shape of whatever one, uh, and you have a vector, you want to multiply every element of your vector with that scalar, uh, you can do that uh, as if these two things are of the same shape without caring about it. And this is basically what uh, broadcasting is referring to. So broadcasting is automatically going to expand some dimensions uh, such that you can do these operations. In the case of my scalar to vector example, uh, natively, what would happen is uh, the scalar would be turned into a vector of the size of the vector you want to multiply scalar with. And you would put in this vector the values of that scalar. So if the scalar would, was 3, then you would have a vector of a shape, whatever is the vector you want to multiply scalar with, with all trees in it. And then you can do element-wise uh, vector product. Okay, so let's go over some of these cases. They are gonna, some are going to be easier than the other. The case I just have given you, where you want, you have a, for example, here a tensor. Uh, the shape is, you can print tensor dot shape. Oh nope. 
Okay, so we see here two by three, and we want to add uh, one to every element of this two by three matrix, and you can do that by tensor plus one. It's going to work. And as I said, what is going to happen in the background is PyTorch is creating another matrix of the size two by three and putting ones in each one of them, and then multiplying these two matrices element wise. Um, Let's create another tensor here. R, R is just going to be a vector uh, of one to nine. Uh, again, here, broadcasting is going to happen um, immediately for us if you have R, R plus two. Uh, and this is by default is going to be element wise uh, sum. So for example, you might have been mistaken. You thought, OK, if I add plus two is going to concatenate, append the, the value two to the end of this tensor, that wouldn't happen because this is the default uh, operation. Similarly with multiplication, is going to do element-wise uh, product uh, of two with every value in the vector. That's great. I think that's pretty intuitive, but can get pretty weird quickly. Um, so this might not be as weird, uh, but uh, still. So here we have a tensor A of a shape two by three. We have another tensor of a shape one by three, and we would like to uh, sum them together. What does this even mean? Well, what's gonna happen in the background is that PyTorch is going to create another matrix of the size two by three, and it's going to repeat this vector here that's recorded in tensor B, two times in two rows, and then it's going to do element-wise sum with tensor A and tensor B. So here you see, you have one, two, three, four, by, uh, five, six in A, 10, 20, 30. And then uh, basically uh, this one is summed with each one of these uh, rows, okay? And this is why dealing with shapes is a little bit weird because once you get an error, you need to kind of uh, find where all these broadcastings have uh, happened. You know, uh, it, it, it's not as simple uh, as it seems. I think this one is still kind of easy to follow, right? Um, let me find more difficult example here. We have a tensor of a shape two by one by three, and you have a tensor of shape uh, three. So vector of size three, and you are going trying to trying to uh, <laughs> sum them. Uh, so what is happening uh, here is that this tensor is going to be broadcast to have a shape of this one two by one by three uh, by stretching it along the first two dimensions, and then again there is going to be um, element wise uh, sum. Yeah, already here it's, you know, you have the same result, it's just that shapes are weird. So uh, it can be become as hard to follow what's going on with these things. And in general, what the PyTorch is doing is uh, it takes the shapes of two tensors, then goes from, uh, ref, uh, from right to left. And uh, as soon as it finds the size one, then it uh, tries to stretch, um, that tensor along that dimension where the one appears. Um, however, if the dimensions don't match, if neither uh, is one, then broadcasting is impossible. So that's, for example, happening uh, here where I have tensor C, which is uh, of the, let's print its shape. Oh, it's uh, of, the, um, of the shape two by two and I'm trying to sum it with a tensor of a shape two by three, that's not gonna work. And this is where you get these errors. The size of a tensor A must match the size of tensor B at non singleton dimension one. This is the most common error you are gonna see. And then you need to find uh, where, why, why are they not uh, matching? And um, as you can tell by my increasing frustration, <laughs> it is uh, frustrating when you try to fix it. Okay, so uh, this is about broadcasting, important, and uh, reshaping and shaping. Uh, as I you know, kind of mentioned, the connection between Torch and NumPy is closed, so you can go back from 
you know, uh, torch tensors into NumPy arrays and other way around. So that's pretty compatible. Uh, you can do these things. And one, uh, another thing that's important with tensors in terms of the operations is that we want to do certain operations along certain dimensions. Uh, so, uh, for example, here we are going to sum, uh, do the sum um, over each row um, instead of just, um, I don't know, uh, doing the uh, sum over columns, uh, which would be by doing the sum and uh, uh, adding dimension equals uh, zero. Okay, and this uh, this is basically available for a ton of basic operations. So, for example, if you want to calculate the standard deviation in every single row, you can do that. Um, yeah, so these things become you know important that you can do this. Um, sums averages ac uh, across dimension. For example, we have just seen that we have, uh, we wanted to average the word embeddings, right? So um, here, if you have, um, if you kind of created a tensor where you stacked your word embeddings in a way where you would get a uh, resulting uh, average embedding by doing the, um, the averaging over a certain dimension, then you can do that, right? Or when we later do our loss function and we want to calculate the gradient, the average gradient over the batch of data, then we don't want to do the for loop. We almost never write for loops in uh, deep learning. Everything is kind of vectorized, tensorized, and then you do this uh, slicing and uh, different kind of operations where you specify dimension you are going to work on. You, you want to avoid uh, for loops uh, always because that's going to uh, slow things because these operations are written in a more optimized way. Okay, so uh, let me see what else is there. Okay, here we have just more example of uh, chaining summing along certain dimensions when you have higher dimensional uh, tensor. And if you don't specify the dimension, it's just going to sum all the, all the values. Okay, let's now try this quiz. I hope I gave you the version where I didn't give you a solution. So uh, by quiz, I mean, you just try it. It's not graded or anything uh, informal, you know, try this uh, thing out. So here you're given a tensor, you need to create a tensor, and then you need to compute the average of each row and each column and check the shape of the results. Oh, I don't know how to turn it on. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna show the first line, which is to create a tensor, you need to use torch.tensor, give the values. And it has to be a list of lists. If you just give a list, um, it wouldn't work, but you could just give a list and then use reshape, meaning dot view to set it to the side. But then you need to make sure that you have use uh, view well. Okay, so once you have that, then you can use on that tensor mean, and to do it row-wise, you say dimension has to be equal one, 
and otherwise for column wise, it's gonna be zero. And these are the two tensors you get. The shape of the first one is gonna be, I keep writing, it's gonna be two and three, which uh, makes sense if we are doing it uh, a row wise, we have two rows, we expect to get two values. If we are doing column wise, we expect to get three values because we have three columns here. Okay, was that feeling good about that? All right, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate nodding. Okay, we have about 10 minutes, so let's try to cover some more things here. So another thing you will be doing a lot is indexing. Uh, and you want to, you know, find the slices of your data and do something with them. So again, creating some ten uh, tensor here of this shape three by two by two. Again, this means we have three slices or three blocks and each one of these blocks, which uh, for us very often correspond to each instance in the batch has two by uh, two uh, uh, matrices. Okay, um, shape. All right, so if you want to access the first element, uh, you would just, uh, you know, uh, say, give me, as if it's a list, give me the first, the, the element with the index zero. And if I'm saying I want a first element, that means if I have these three elements here, then I expect to get a matrix of the shape two by two. And uh, if we print the shape of this thing, we should be seeing that. Right, so we have two, two by two. Um, all right, if you want to select the first uh, row in our three by two by two um, uh, tensor, all first row, then with column, you specify, basically you say across all of the elements in this uh, dimension, give me the first value. So uh, here we have, okay, across all of the elements in a batch, give me first, which means if you have to, uh, if you have matrices, give me the first row. And let's see whether that's true. We have one, two, five, six, nine, nine 10, and that's it. One, two, five, six, nine, 10. These are the first row uh, of each of the matrices in uh, our three batches of data. Okay, and you see how we are not using any four loops here, right? Like we could be looping over all of these dimensions and finding these things. We are not going to be doing that. Okay, what is here? Uh, we can index over multiple dimensions. So here, x0, 0. So this means over all of the batches in all of the first rows, give me the first uh, thing in the first row. So we have 159 here, which makes sense. In the first row, one, five, nine, right? Again, a little bit hard to, I think, on if you're seeing this for the first time, it can be kind of uh, a little bit hard to wrap your mind around this. And then if we say use colon for all dimensions, because colon means give me all of the elements uh, in that dimension, then you would basically get your tensor, right? Okay. Another thing you will see a lot in our, you know, libraries is, uh, you know, when we switch to Hugging Face and we look how they write the code, uh, which is based on PyTorch, is that you will use another tensor to say which elements of your tensor you wanna, uh, you you want. So we have still our same tensor X that we had before, which is maybe I can just print it to remind ourselves. So here and its shape. Okay, this is our tensor, three by two by two. And here I'm specifying another tensor, which serves as my indexing tensor, where I have zero, zero, one, one. And basically what this does, is says, give me the, uh, the first element of my tensor, give me the first element of my tensor again, give me the second element of my tensor and give me the second element. Right, and we know that the all of these uh, first, second, and third elements are two by two matrices. So let's see what do we get. We get our, this is our first element in a tensor. Great, we get it, we get it again. This is our second element in a tensor. Perfect, we get it again and again. So this is a little bit more advanced indexing where you use another um, 
tensor to say which element of your original tensor you want. And it can become a little bit hard to you know, specify the indexing tensor right to ensure that you are getting the uh, right slices of your data. And you can also use two uh, tensors for slicing across multiple uh, dimension. So here we want to access the zero, uh, which I call first element of the first and the second uh, elements. And basically you do this with uh, this uh, notation over here. So you take your first element in your tensor. Again, this was this one. And then you access the uh, first and uh, second uh, elements of it, which um, let me see whether that makes sense. Oh. Oh, I'm lost. Let me see. Five, six, and nine, and ten. Uh huh. So yeah, basically this says uh from the first and the second element, I will switch to I started counting from one. So this is for me second and third element in my original tensors, which are this uh, second to last and the last two by two matrix. Uh, take the first element, which is the first row. And that's why we got five, six, uh, nine, and uh, 10. Okay, guys, we have four more minutes. So please uh, be patient uh, until we finish. Um, okay, and final thing in terms of the indexing, please, uh, I don't know who is speaking, but it's distracting. Um, the last thing you might wanna do when you retrieve the actual uh, elements by slicing, what you will get with uh, PyTorch is tensors. And sometimes you don't want tensors, PyTorch tensors, you want values. And you can get that by calling item. So for example, here, if you um, retrieve from your first um, uh, matrix in your batch of three matrices, uh, from the first row, first element, you will get the value one, but it's going to be retrieved with the slicing as a tensor. And you want actual value in that tensor, so you call item on it, and then you will get the actual number. Okay. Okay. So here is an exercise you can do home. I just want to finish with uh, AutoGrad. Okay. So so far we have covered tensors, how to do these operations. But remember when we have when I introduced free forward neural network, and I said, okay, we are now need to calculate all these gradients. And I said, well, luckily for us, we won't be doing that by hand. Rather, we will have the use automatic differentiation that's implemented in these techniques. And uh, this is what Autograd is. Autograd is basically a mechanism that calculates gradients for us. When you implement a neural network in a PyTorch, what's created is a node, uh, where each one of these basically things, A1, becomes a node in your graph. And each one of these nodes is then associated with two variables. The value here, what is the outcome of this operation, as well as another variable, which is the gradient at that node. And you know how chain rule basically is multiplying the gradients and different you know, points of operations. Basically use these gradients that are recorded in these variables associated with each, with each one of these operations to be able to do this 